Breathe deeply to energize the body and to wake up the mind. This is a necessary step in the breath meditation because if you start out with a very relaxed breath, it's very easy to drift off. So energize things a little bit. Breathe deeply. Think of the breath going all the way down through your torso, waking up the different elements in the body. And then allow things to settle down in a way that feels good, feels right. A lot of the meditation lies in finding a way of breathing, a way of thinking about the breath that you find interesting, you find easy to stay with. And John Lee recommends various ways of thinking about the breath. You try them out and you see what works and what doesn't work. Because the whole point of concentration practice is you want to settle down with a sense of well-being. And so you try to figure out how to adjust his instructions. in the way that gets the results, and it's, at the same time it's not just simply following in line with your laziness. That requires a proper balance. Mbu Kamdi, one of the forest of Johns, said that the state of mind you're trying to develop here is like that of a hunter. Don has to go out and sit very, very still so as not to scare off the animals. But at the same time, he has to be very alert. He has to be very patient. Because after all, you're not making an appointment with a rabbit to come at two in the afternoon. You have no idea when the rabbit's going to come. But you put yourself in a place where it's very likely for the rabbits to come, and then you stay there very still and very alert. In other words, the insights you're looking for are going to come here in the present moment, so you place yourself here and you want to be very still right here. So you can see the subtle things that are happening. And you have to be very alert, again, to see the subtle things that are happening. So that requires the proper balance between being energized and calm. being very still and very sensitive. And John Sowell would often talk about making the mind strong and gentle at the same time. Strong in the sense that you're not going to let yourself be knocked off the theme of your meditation right now. No matter what comes up, you're going to stay with the breath. Even if you're dealing with feelings or mind states, you want them to be related to the fact that you're staying with the breath as your anchor here in the present moment. At the same time, you want to be gentle in the sense of being very sensitive to what's going on. No, we're trying to be sensitive, not simply to enjoy the subtleties of the present moment. It's because there's important work to be done here, important things to understand about what's going on in the mind. Because the processes that are playing out here play out in the larger realm as well. You get to see the mind as it thirsts after things, as we chanted just now. We tend to be a slave to craving. And yet we take the slavery so for granted that we hardly even notice it. So now's a chance to watch it with the purpose of getting free from it. We cling to things. As we were saying earlier today, the relationship between craving and clinging is like that between thirst and feeding. You feel a lack, and then you look for something that's going to fill up the lack, and then you grab hold of whatever you find. And for most of us, we're like little children who have no idea what's really good food and what's poisonous, or what's just neither food or poison, just, just not food, like stones and things. 
The child just puts anything it sees into its mouth. So we want to learn how to get some control over that, get some wisdom with regard to that. What things do you want to take as your nourishment? As we're focusing here on the present moment, it's to see processes that are bigger than the present moment as well. They can be found here, they can be seen here, but they're going to play out in larger realms as well. The way the mind relates to itself simply in a simple activity like this tells you a lot about how it's going to relate to other things in life. It's like the practice they had in the old days. I was at an antique shop one time in Chiang Mai, and there were all these carrying poles that were very elaborate. You know, in Thailand they carry things on the shoulders with one load in front, one load in back, balanced on your shoulder. And all the poles I had seen were pretty ordinary, but these were very artistically done. So I asked the person who was running the store, what were these for? And she said, back in the old days, when you went to the monastery to take your alms food, you would carry it over your shoulder. And if a young man was interested in a young woman, he would carve a pole for her to take. And she'd take one look at the carving, and she'd know what kind of person he was. The way he carved, the style, the craftsmanship would tell you a lot about how he would approach other things. It's the same with the way you relate to the present moment here. It tells you a lot about how you're going to relate to other things in life, so the ramifications go out. Try to be very precise, very observant in what you do here. As the Buddha said, he was looking for two things in a student. One is the student be observant, and to the student be honest. You've got to be honest about what you're doing. The mind does have this tendency to lie to itself. You tell yourself, I'm here with the breath, and you're wandering off someplace else before you even know it. So you have to catch yourself as you lie to yourself. You have to be observant. Make up your mind, you really are going to stay here with the breath, and you really are going to look into what kind of breathing feels good now, what works and what doesn't work in getting the mind to settle down. A lot of experimentation is required here. We'd all like to have a, a good recipe book for meditation, the kind that are foolproof. But working with the mind is a lot more complicated than working with food. There's some things that you can learn from books, some things you can learn from Dharma talks, but there's an awful lot that has to go, has to be learned from your own practice, from your being honest, and from your being observant. And the Buddha recommends. Not only that you focus on the breath, but that you bring in other themes when you see necessary. If you find yourself getting a little lackadaisical about the practice or getting careless, one of the themes he recommends is that you think about the fact of death. Now, for most of us, the thinking about death is a scary thought. We like to push it away, but that, of course, doesn't push death itself away. It just makes us stupid. You remember the forgotten which philosopher who said it was the beginning of wisdom comes from your realization of death. And asking questions about your life. What kind of life do I want to live, given the fact that it's going to end? Well, the Buddha has you think about that. Each time you breathe in, each time you breathe out, you can remind yourself, may I live just for this one more breath? so I can accomplish something in the practice. 
when we talk about appreciating the present moment, that's what we should appreciate, that we have this opportunity to train the mind, to see it more clearly, to develop skillful qualities and drop unskillful ones. That would be the proper reason for treasuring this breath as it comes in, this breath as it goes out, and the next one, and the next one, however many you get. But you want to appreciate each one for the opportunity it supplies. Because you should look into the present moment, you see a lot of the issues that are going to be important when death comes. Because after all, when is it, where is it going to come? It's going to come right here. When, you don't know, but you do know where. It's going to be right here, right where the mind and the body meet here at the breath. So you want to get to know this place really well. It's like knowing that someone's planning to mug you down on a certain street corner. You go down, you check the street corner to see how you can avoid the mugger. At the very least, minimize the amount of suffering. The Buddha says to think about the fact that death could come at any time, and then you ask yourself, okay, what unfinished business do I have? Are there still unskillful thoughts in my mind? If you notice that there's attitudes of greed, aversion, delusion, or any of the reasons why you might fear death. He says, try to work on that as quickly and with the same sense of urgency and mindfulness that a person whose head was on fire would try to put out the fire. Notice he talks about mindfulness there. Mindfulness is not just a nice, accepting state that was going to watch the flames and see how beautiful they are as your hair burns. Your hair is burning, you've got to put it out. And mindfulness is what keeps you focused on the fact that this is the most important thing right now. If you've got unskillful states in your mind, those are the things you've got to work on. Any of the reasons you might fear death, the Buddha lists four. One, there's attachment to the body, identifying this body as yourself the fear that you would go out of existence when this body goes. Two, there's attachment to sensuality, all the pleasures you can think of here in the human realm that you'd hate to leave. Three, there'd be the knowledge you have done harmful things to other people, and there's that fear that you might get punished on the other side. And then four, there's doubt about the true Dharma. Did the Buddha really know what he was talking about? Is there a deathless element in the mind? Is there not? Can you find it through your own efforts? If you're not sure about that, it, death is a very scary prospect. So those are the things you've got to work on. See where you're attached to the body, where you identify with it. And as the Buddha says, learn to regard it as not being worthy of calling it yourself. He doesn't say there is no self, but he does say you can't really own the body. It doesn't really belong to you. Of course, he doesn't say there is a self either. But he does want you to look at the way you identify with things. That's something you can observe right here, right now. There are states of mind that don't latch on to the body, that don't identify with it. Can you nurture those? The same with sensuality. This is one of the reasons why we work on developing the sense of well-being that comes from getting the mind settled down here in this sense of the body as you feel it from within, because that gives rise to a pleasure that allows you to let go of your other pleasures, put you in a position where you can look at their drawbacks and say that you really don't want to identify with that kind of pleasure. If all you see is the pleasure that comes from sensuality, if you think that's the only alternative pain to pain, you're not going to look at the alter <coughs> excuse me, you're not going to want to look at their drawbacks. You won't want to let go. But if you see that there is a higher level of pleasure, a higher level of well-being, then you can taste it and you can draw on it when you need it. Then it makes it a lot easier for you to look at the pleasures of sight, sound, smells, taste, tactile sensations, and especially the pleasure of just 
fantasizing and obsessing about what kind of pleasure you want out of those things. You can see the drawbacks and realize that that's not where you find true satisfaction. When you can let go of those two, two things, your attachment to the body and your attachment to sensual pleasures, death is a lot less scary. As for the fear that comes from knowing you've done unskillful things, well, the Buddha says, do skillful things. And focus on those, the recollection of your virtue, the recollection of your generosity. These are really sustaining for the mind. I mean, you see this even as you sit here and meditate. There are times when the meditation is not going well and you start thinking, I just don't have it. I don't have the potential. But then you can recollect on things, on times when you've been generous and you didn't have to be. Times when you could have gotten away with harming other people, but you didn't. And you realize that you do have worth as a human being. And that recollection can be sustaining. The Buddha wasn't the sort of person who said, when, when you give something, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Because that's almost as if you're ashamed to be generous. You don't go around bragging about it, but at the same time you remind yourself this is the sign of a, a noble human being. There's dignity in being generous, dignity in being virtuous, and you've got that. That's a sustaining thought. As for the last reason for fearing death, the only way you're going to get past that one is, is to meditate really seriously. And see, what the Buddha say about true happiness, is it true? Can you find it through your own efforts? The only way you'll be able to come over that doubt is to actually taste it for yourself. So here's your opportunity. You've got this breath. Remind yourself, may I live for the interval of one in and out breath? So I can accomplish much in terms of the Buddha's teachings. That way of thinking about death is not depressing. It's actually energizing. You've got something valuable right here. You've got this breath coming in going out, and there's a lot can be done, that can be done with this breath coming in going out. A lot to be learned both about the body and the mind. A lot that can be made more skillful in terms of the mind. So take advantage of this while you've got it.